welcome to VoiceOver Work, an audiobook sampler. Where do you listen? I'm Russell, founder of Newton Media Group. Today, we're going to help you decide if you want to listen to that one. Stick around for the chapter-by-chapter -chapter summary of Patrick King's Massive Charisma. We're always told that our interpersonal skills are the key to what we want in life, and it's true. Let the tips, questions, approaches, and techniques contained in Massive Charisma be your guide to growing your sense of personal magnetism and charm. This is Patrick King's newest audiobook, Massive Charisma, and here is the chapter-by-chapter -chapter summary. Part 1. Cultivating a Charismatic Aura Chapter 1. So, what is charisma anyway? There's something special about them. People with charisma are just so appealing. They're charming, they're likable, and they somehow make everyone gravitate towards them. Is it magic? Is it just a chemistry thing? If you've ever wanted to be that person in the room with the most magnetic, captivating aura, then this book is for you. When we're in the presence of charismatic people, it can be hard to say precisely why we're so bewitched. Charisma can start to seem like something that you're just born with, or not. But thankfully, this kind of allure is not some mysterious power that only a few possess. It is a 100% social skill that you can practice, even if you don't quite see yourself that way now. Charisma is really a collection of different behaviors and attitudes that radiate a certain very attractive mindset to others. We'll divide our Charisma Crash Course into two main parts in the chapters that follow. First, you'll learn how to develop your own unique brand of charm within yourself. Then in Part 2, you'll learn to carry that aura out into the world and broadcast it to those you interact with. With Charisma, you're more empathetic, more engaging, and a much, much better conversationalist. You're interesting and interested. And because you're witty and emotionally intelligent, people like you and trust you. It's hard to imagine an area of life that isn't improved with a little charisma, dating, work, friendships. Even chatting to strangers at a bus stop becomes an opportunity for winning people over with enchanting banter. Before we dive in, though, let's dispel one misconception. Being charismatic is not about being loud, extroverted, or cocky. In fact, by the end of this book, the hope is that you'll see there are many ways to be charming, whether that's being flashy and larger than life, or quietly confident and a little mysterious. A practical definition. Conveniently for us, in 2018, researchers at the University of Toronto studied the phenomena of charisma and developed a working definition. After studying over a thousand people, the team concluded that charisma was a mix of two things. One, affability. Two, influence. Affability broadly means that people are pleasant to be around and easily approachable. However you define it, warmth, pleasantness, friendliness, this is the quality that makes you think, hmm, I like this person. Influence is defined as leadership potential, presence, and the ability to influence and persuade people. Not only did the team discover that it was actually possible to measure these two traits, but also that people were fairly accurate at rating themselves, i.e., when self-ratings were compared to ratings by others, they were more or less the same. They created the General Charisma Inventory, GCI, which you can basically complete yourself right now. Read the following statements and give yourself a rating from 1 to 5, with 1 for strongly disagree and 5 for strongly agree. The first three are about influence, while the latter three are about affability. I'm someone who has a presence in a room. Chapter 2. Building Real-World Charisma 
We've fleshed out a usable definition of charisma and broken it down into its parts, and hopefully you've been able to zoom in on all those parts of charisma that you're already getting right and those that need a little more work. This leads us to the obvious next question. How do we get better? First things first, your charisma won't look like anyone else's charisma. This makes sense. Think of any famous charismatic people from history, and they're all different from one another. Marilyn Monroe, Stalin, and Steve Jobs were all enigmatic characters, but in very different ways. This is precisely what Olivia Fox Cabane, author of The Charisma Myth, found, i.e., that there are different types of charisma. She listed four general categories, but even within these groups, it's easy to see the endless possible variations. The Focused Charismatic This is someone who places deep, undivided attention on others and makes them feel like the most important person in the room. Talk show hosts build their brands on this kind of charisma, as do motivational speakers and cult leaders. You'll know this is your preferred charisma style if you're often told you're a good listener. Focused charismatics are people that know the best way to shine is to show off others to their best. If you often find yourself in the guru role of guiding people to be the best they can be, this may be your strong area. The Visionary Charismatic Recall Riggio's theory about emotional and social expressiveness. We're drawn to those who can move us to see their inspiring vision of the future, especially if they have the enthusiasm and energy to campaign for that vision. Think about Steve Jobs building a following devoted to his vision of the future, or Martin Luther King Jr.'s rousing speeches. Innovators and creative people can excel at visionary charisma too, since they need to convince others to buy into a vision that only they can see. If you've ever managed to get people rallied together on a passion project, and if your visions seem infectious, you might have this type of charisma. The Kind Charisma Emotional connection is powerful stuff. Think of the Dalai Lama and how profoundly he influences people without conventional trappings of wealth and power. He does so purely on an emotional level with genuine warmth and compassion. If you're a person who can drastically elevate situations with kindness, mercy, empathy, and benevolence, this form of charisma may be your strongest. The Authoritative Charismatic Finally, a more classic picture of a charismatic leader, like Stalin or Hitler. People with this style of influence use power and status to position themselves as authorities, experts, or leaders. Such people seem to naturally command control and effortlessly lead others. Do you frequently find that other people defer to your judgment or put you in charge of important tasks? You might be better at exuding this kind of charisma than the other types. Now, this isn't to say that these are the only types. If you think of famous charismatics from history, you'll find many that don't fit the mold. Some may inspire and lead people because of their bravery and strength sporting heroes, those who beat the odds after disease or injury. Some may captivate and enthrall people with immense beauty, grace, or sex appeal, the starlets from Hollywood's golden era. Others may capture people's admiration through humor, creativity, or originality. Robin Williams' comic genius could hit on an emotional level. And others may guard... Chapter 3. Putting it all together. In Chapters 1 and 2, we looked at several different models and theories that could help us better grasp the charisma phenomenon. We considered the researchers at the University of Toronto and their general charisma inventory, outlining affability and influence aspects. We examined Riggio's model, which put expressiveness, sensitivity, and control as the three tasks of charisma, whether applied to emotional aspects or social ones. We explored Olivia Fox Cabane's Power Presence Warmth Trinity, and looked at some of her practical exercises for visualization and ritual. Finally, we looked at Friedman's theory, which focused on affective communication and how charismatic people are those that express themselves non-verbally. Well, that's a lot to take in. How can we pull all this together into something that will make a difference in our lives? Each of these theories is a blend of explanation, description of traits, 
and suggestions for practical exercises we can all try to become more charismatic. In this chapter, we synthesize the best of each theory and create our own meta-theory. Below, we'll look at the five traits most consistently associated with charisma. Consider it a cheat sheet. Trait 1. Likeability and warmth, or affability, arguably the most important trait. If you can smile, put people at ease, and accept others for who they are, you're already halfway there. Challenge yourself to smile at a stranger every day. Look for ways to laugh and be lighthearted. Commit, right now, to never being that person who gossips, criticizes, or judges people in public. Instead, make it a habit to genuinely learn what others can teach you in every interaction and take it upon yourself to shine the light of your attention on others so they feel seen, appreciated, and listened to. Trait 2. Power and Influence The ability to convince and persuade others, and being perceived as competent and in control. The only chance you have of being an inspirational presence in people's lives, and to have them believe in you, is to start with belief in yourself. Tap into those things you know with all your heart, the skills you're a natural expert at, and the values that mean more than anything to you. Find your raw, sparkling passion and communicate it loud and clear to others. Think of influence as the transmission of conviction from one person to another, but you must have that conviction in the first place. Trait 3. Emotional Intelligence Charisma is not about logic, intelligence, or being right. It's about emotions. Being emotionally intelligent means knowing how to perceive the emotions of others as well as ensuring that your own are communicated. Charismatic people don't just rely on words. They can engage emotionally on nonverbal channels. The single best way to ramp up your emotional intelligence is to get into your body. Use all of yourself to communicate, including your voice, posture, movement, and gesture. Likewise, watch closely how other people present themselves, all of themselves. Listening is about close conscious awareness and the perception of patterns that go beyond the words people say. Trait 4. Presence, Awareness, and Self-Control Anxiety, distraction, assumption, expectation, and getting stuck in our own heads. All of this take us out of the moment. Part 2. Creating Charismatic Interactions Chapter 4. The Bedrock of Good Communication In Part 1, we looked at clear definitions for what charisma actually is, as well as explored four different models or theories about what charisma is made of and how to increase each of these aspects in ourselves. With consistent practice smiling, being present, adjusting body language, conveying warmth, and so on, we can cultivate our own unique charismatic aura that people can't help but feel when they're in our presence. In part two, we take this carefully cultivated aura and further extend it to others in social interactions. Just as we are in charge of the persona we broadcast to others, we also have a degree of control over how interactions play out. With a little know-how, we can learn to create moments, conversations, and connections that really sparkle. Charisma in action is not all that different from being a scintillating conversationalist, a good listener, a witty storyteller, or an empathetic friend. In other words, it's impossible to be charismatic without exceptional communication skills. In the following chapters, we'll look at simple and straightforward ways to be a better listener, master small talk, read people's emotions, and engage authentically with people. But all of this stems from a more fundamental skill, without which none of it can happen. Empathy. Empathy is so, so much more than feeling for others when something bad happens to them. Empathy is really the only thing that allows human beings to reach out and connect to one another emotionally. Without empathy, we cannot imagine another person's world, perspective, or emotions. 
Philosophers call this capacity to guess at the hidden inner world of people other than ourselves theory of mind. In imagining another's inner world, empathy is the what and communication is the how. If we want to connect emotionally with others and share in their world, we need to understand how to communicate with them. If there isn't empathy, other people are no more than abstract entities to us, rather than living, breathing beings that we can feel. There are actually two kinds of empathy, positive and negative. A charismatic person has both. Picture a woman who wins last place at a beauty pageant. She smiles broadly, hugs the winner, and congratulates her. She revels in the winner's excitement and takes pleasure in her happiness, telling her how proud she is of her. It's a good look, right? This is what's called positive empathy, the ability to derive joy from other people's joy and to feel good purely because they do. This is not even about social self-control, but genuine pleasure at other people's fortunes. It's the opposite of jealousy, insecurity, and selfishness because it centers and finds satisfaction in someone else. The irony is that it ends up making the admirer so much more likable, too. Charismatic people are never jealous, at least not outwardly, and they don't compete in public or put themselves or others down. Watch any interview with the charismatic Dolly Parton, for example, and observe how she never puts down others in the industry, even those who criticize her. She playfully laughs off even insults with grace and humor. I'm not offended by all the dumb blonde jokes, because I know I'm not dumb. I also know I'm not blonde. You can improve your own charisma. Chapter 5. Engaging Fully Questions. An Underrated Superpower The physicist and theorist Heisenberg famously said, What we observe is not nature itself, but nature exposed to our method of questioning. In the realm of conversation, we can take this to mean that what we see when we engage with other people is not how they really are, but how they look in relation to how we talk to them and the questions we pose. To put it bluntly, if you ask boring questions, you get boring answers. If you don't ask any questions, well, the person in front of you starts to look like nothing more than a blank. With all this focus on our own mindset, our preparedness, and our ability to set the mood, we can forget that we always have at hand a very effective technique for reaching others. Just ask them. Questions initiate and move conversations along particular paths. They give you some control and direction. They help you show interest, and they help you genuinely connect to and understand the person in front of you. In fact, questions are so important that it's hard to imagine anyone getting far in conversations without them. Here we'll focus on the emotional rather than informational impact of questions. You're not asking someone something because you literally don't know the answer and want them to tell you. That's what Google is for. In that sense, the answer can be important, sure, but it's not all that's important. Simply asking in the first place, and the way you ask, can also send a powerful message. This chapter is about participating fully in conversations, and the backbone of quality participation is to think like a scientist like Heisenberg, and get curious. The first thing to understand, not all questions are created equally. We can group exchanges and therefore questions into three levels according to their underlying purpose. The first is to exchange information or learn. The second, to exchange feelings or emotions or get others to bond with and like us. And the third is to exchange values. Ditto. It's worth knowing the difference so you're clear on what kind of conversation you're having and why. For example, the know-it-all from our first chapter makes a mistake in responding to other people's appeals for an exchange of emotion and feelings by supplying factual information instead. This is the person who completely misses the point by focusing on the details and not shared emotional content. The second thing to understand is that we need to master both the asking and the answering of questions at the right level. Doing so makes us more likable, more empathetic, and more successful at connecting to others. Let's take a closer look at how to frame and interpret questions to use them to their best advantage. Just ask more. 
Chances are you're simply not asking enough questions. Even emotionally intelligent people can fail to show enough curiosity for others. Maybe you're too busy thinking of yourself or stressed about the interaction, still egocentric, or maybe you genuinely don't care enough to know the answer. Maybe you think questions make you look nosy or, worse, unsure of yourself, but the opposite is true. Harvard research by Allison Wood Brooks and colleagues showed that when people were instructed to ask more questions in a conversation, people rated them as more likable than those who asked fewer questions. Speed daters were also found to agree more readily to a second date if their first date was filled with plenty of questions. Don't be worried about coming off badly. The truth is that questions unlock the next level of human connection and may even be more powerful in situations where questions are not expected, such as job interviews. They show that you're paying attention, that you care, that you're engaging in... Chapter 6. Subtly Charismatic. Humor and Misdirection. It's time to lighten things up, wouldn't you say? Let's turn our attention to the surprisingly versatile skills of humor, or its closely related cousin, misdirection. To put it simply, misdirection is when you say one thing and then proceed with an immediate opposite. For example, it's a secret, but let me tell you immediately. Or, that show's great, except for everyone in it. It's not rolling in the aisles funny, but it definitely captures attention and gives conversation a kind of light playfulness that most people will be happy to call wit. It seems confusing, but what you're doing is breaking a sentence into two parts. You're stating something in the first part, then contradicting it immediately in the second. People won't immediately be sure of what you mean, and part of the humor comes from this introduced confusion. You have both positive and negative, or vice versa, in the same sentence. The second part of the sentence is the element that people will react to, while the first part is typically the setup. The second is your true sentiment on the topic. This formula is the secret to the humor in such lines as George Jessel's, The human brain is a wonderful organ. It starts to work as soon as you're born and doesn't stop until you get to deliver a speech. Douglas Adams also used it when he said, I love deadlines. I like the whooshing sound they make as they fly by. Here's another example. I love dogs, but I hate seeing, hearing, or touching them. Or, this juice is awesome. Did it come from the garbage disposal? There's just such an appealing zing to statements like this. You can probably agree that they work, but... Why do they work? Most of us try to be polite to people. We use euphemisms frequently, and we don't say what we really feel. The first part of a misdirecting statement is what people expect, politeness. It's you following the same old, tired, expected script. But then, surprise, you contradict yourself and give them a dose of reality, which sets up a humorous contrast since you've deviated from what most people expect and would say themselves. As you might have observed, ironic smiles also make use of misdirection to derive comedic effect. The whole effect is to send a powerful message that you don't take yourself or the topic at hand all that seriously. Done right, misdirection can be amazingly charming and funny. It's a way to break the rules that works so well because you appear to be using the rules at first. Last but not least, misdirection is simply a funny way to express your feelings on something. If you really feel X about a topic, then use misdirection. Opposite of X, but actually X, will almost always be received far better than, gosh, I hate X. Sarcasm is a way for people to say things without saying them, and is the most common way we use misdirection. Think about how Chandler Bing from the television show Friends talks. If he says something is wonderful, it's wonderful in a tone that immediately lets you know that he thinks the opposite. Sarcasm functions like a social cue. Both are ways to express something without having to explicitly say it. In that way, it's a great device for handling uncomfortable topics or pointing out the elephant in the room without...
We hope you love this episode of Voice Over Work, an audiobook sampler. Where do you listen? Head on over to iTunes, YouTube, or Facebook and subscribe or rate or leave a review, whatever's appropriate for the platform. It's very much appreciated. Thank you, and we'll see you in three or four days with our next book.